Hello everyone, thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Felicia Garcia. I'm the Curator of Education at the Indian Arts Research Center. Tonight we are here to virtually celebrate 2020 Eric and Barbara Dobkin Native Artist Fellow, Leah Matafrawa. Leah is a Northern Chumash artist and a practitioner of place-based arts. Being a Samoa Chumash woman myself, it feels very special for me to have this opportunity to introduce one of my Chumash relatives. Leah's work is often utilitarian, but she also uses her practice to spread awareness about the effects of climate change. As a member of a coastal California indigenous community, she has witnessed severe environmental degradation firsthand, which has greatly diminished her community's access to traditional resources and materials. Through her work, she hopes to bring attention to these issues and inspire action. When Leah applied for the fellowship at SAR, her goal was to utilize this time to create a traditional Chumash dance dress that would visually represent rising ocean levels and the increasing severity of wildfires. Since arriving on campus, Leah has faced several new and unforeseen challenges accessing traditional materials due to the current public health situation, but she has been extremely flexible and we are so excited to see what she has been working on during her presentation tonight. We will be sorry to see Leah go, but since she is based just a short drive away at Jemez Pueblo, there will be plenty of opportunities to see her work locally in the future. And we look forward to having Leah back on campus when we are once again open to the public. I also wanted to share some information about another opportunity that we have to hear from Leah. Next Tuesday on May 26th at 2 p.m., we will be hosting a virtual conversation with Leah as part of our SAR Impact series. This event is for SAR members, but it's not too late to join. You can find more information on our website or our Facebook page. We will also include a link in the description for this video. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to thank Eric and Barbara Dobkin for their generosity in supporting this fellowship. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Leah Matafrawa. So my project at SAR is I'm making a Chumash dance dress with the intent that it won't be danced in, but it will be um, a springboard for talking about climate change. The dress that I'm making um, is a little bit different in, in some of the colors that I'm using, but I really wanted to transform the viewers to think about place-based materials and to think about the impacts of climate change especially for those communities that are already being hard hit that live in coastal areas. Um, I think that people who don't live in coastal areas or don't have a strong relationship with their, with their environment um, often miss the signs of climate change. Um, so they're not seeing it and they're not being impacted or um, they're not being displaced because of it. Um, and so I wanted to bring attention to those of us in coastal areas that are experiencing climate change or seeing it. Right, so um, let me see if I can get you to see this. So here's um, the dress, or this is just the front apron. Um, Chumash dresses usually contain um, a front apron and a back apron. Our front aprons in Central Coast um, areas are usually made with willow, which this is a willow bark or cottonwood. Um, other areas of California use materials that grow in their bioregions. So maybe up north it might be um, maple bark. Um, so there might be different types of bark used, um, but oftentimes you'll see a front apron and then a back apron. And our back aprons are usually hide. Um, a front apron doesn't always need to be bark. Um, sometimes we wear a front apron all the way or a, a bark skirt all the way around, so it's not just a front apron. Um, but also sometimes our um, front aprons can be, um, for our community, it can be um, otter or another hide. People who aren't used to seeing California dance dresses or California regalia, um, but for people who live in California, we can tell you kind of what area it comes from, um, just based on materials and, and design elements. Um, so for this particular skirt, you'll see at the bottom, it's painted with a natural blue ochre. Normally we don't paint our bark skirts, um, 
But again, I wanted to represent that ocean water rising, so that's why it's painted blue. Um, we do use red ochre quite a bit um, and white, but uh, again, for this particular piece, it's not supposed to be accurate in terms of um, a historical look. It's supposed to have a, a different look to it. So um, our back skirts are again tied. So here's a back skirt. This will be, well, it was painted with the same blue ochre. Um, and it goes around the back and we attach some, first we tie in our front aprons and then we put on our, um, our back aprons and they tie like this. Um, and then we usually have a belt. So here's a belt underneath. Um, and the belt that I did is actually a replica of one that's at uh, the collections in Smithsonian. Um, and it's made with trade beads and then some of our traditional um, sea urchin spine or pokey things, beads. I don't know the accurate name for those, but um, so and um, also we don't nor we well we didn't wear tops and um, we wore our necklaces um or we just went um without a top most of the time and you know it wasn't until the spanish came um with their religion that um, we were made to cover up or thought to well we never thought of um not wearing a top as being taboo or sexualized in any way um, until the Spanish came, um, we were forced to start believing that it was taboo. And um, so we were forced to cover up and wear Western clothes. Um, so in a lot of my dresses or in a lot of my dolls, you will see them without tops. Even when I have um, my models photograph it, as long as they're um, over, over 18, um, I usually try and have them um, pose without um, the tops. Um, and again, it isn't about sexualizing women. It's about um, pushing back on patriarchy and um, Catholicism that was forced on our communities. So um, I try to always um, put that element into my work or that statement into my work because um, I want people to be aware um, and not sexualize um, our dance dresses and and understand that we had a different worldview. Um, with that, I, I have a couple species of shells that I wanted to show you guys and talk a little bit more about my materials um, and how we process them and some of the impacts of climate change on our materials. So currently there's a ban on abalone gathering. Um, there's been a ban um, from the Golden Gate down for for quite a number of decades now. But more recently where you could um, harvest abalone um, about an hour north of the Gar Golden Gate Bridge and up north, um, that was the only area where you could continue to gather. Um, but um, two years ago, there was a moratorium on abalone gathering. Reason being is that the species is not doing well. And I am concerned that it will not recover. Um, and south of the Golden Gate Bridge in my area, there's, like I said, there's been a, a moratorium on abalone gathering for a couple decades, <clears throat> and we're nowhere near um, the recovery process for the species. Um, there are several species of abalone, and I have a few here. So um, this here is one that people um, are familiar with. It's really green and vibrant colors. This is actually power shell which isn't indigenous to California, but a lot of people use it, or they'll use um, buy beads that are dyed to look like this. So a lot of shell companies in China, they'll buy um, white shell and then just dye it to make it look like abalone. Um, so it's not, it's not abalone, but um, this here is a pink. Um, I don't know if you can see it in the camera, but it's got a lot of pinks in it. Um, and then I have a uh, black abalone, um, which has a real white inside. There's white abalones, green abalones, um, which were all, and black abalones, which um, were all prevalent in Central Coast, California. The other abalone I want to talk about is the um, red abalone. And this is most common in California. It runs 
all the way down the coast, even to Baja, California. Um, these are the larger um, shells. They're thicker. Um, blacks are, um, once this back skirt is finished, it'll have shells hanging from it. Um, and it'll be decorated with various shells, clam shells, olive shells, um, which aren't as endangered, but are getting there. Um, so usually what I do is I take a template um, that I've made and I take my shells and I draw, there's the templates. So here you can kind of see I've drawn um, some water drops. So these will be cut and processed and then put on the skirt. And that's um, a short version of it. It takes a lot of time to do this work. Um, abalone shells are very toxic, so I also have to wear a lot of protective gear, work with water. It's quite messy. Um, it, it, it really smells a lot, so you have to have good ventilation in your studios. Um, so I'm going to show you a little bit of that process, and I'm going to walk you around here. Um, so usually what I do is I trace, and then I cut my shells um, using either a um, ring saw um, or I really like this because it has a thinner blade. This is my um, band saw. So both of these work with water. Um, and then usually I come over to my grinders. And for those of you that work with um, or jewelers or woodworkers, you'll understand this. Um, so you start with a specific grit. Um, the thicker shells, I start with like a 60 or 80 grit. Um, for thinner shells, I can start mm, 100 or two, 200 usually. And then I just keep moving up um, with finer sandpapers. Um, so I'll maybe go from, you know, the 80 to a 120 and then um, a 200 to 400 to a 6 to an 8. Um, a lot of people don't take those steps or that many steps, but I do because I absolutely hate rough work or scratches in my work um and then i have to drill them so then i come over here i work on my drill um again in water i fill this with water um and then i come over here and i work um to buff and polish just like uh, a jeweler's buff and polishing machine um and then for a lot of my work, if I'm doing intricate cuts like stars or basket designs, um, I don't like rugged edges. I don't like it when people don't sand <laughs> in their edges. So I kind of made this. This is um, attached to my buffer and I put a diamond wheel on and then I can get some really accurate. And that's kind of the process. So it can take um, you know, and I do a lot of hand sanding to get those um, pieces um, so they don't have any scratches in them. So, uh, literally one piece can take over an hour to make probably about two, two pieces, I mean, two hours just to make this one piece here. Um, and if it has more intricate cuts, like a star, um, or whatnot, you know, it takes a couple hours just to make one piece. Um, so it's not something that's, um, quick and easy. And then, you know, if I need maybe 80 pieces just to attach to the skirt, you're talking just 80 hours just prepping and getting the shell ready to attach to the skirt. Um, and that doesn't include our gathering and harvest time. So, you know, if we're out gathering bark, that's a couple of days worth of work. Processing the bark, that's a couple of days of work. And then um, putting the skirt together is another couple of days. So this isn't easy um a lot of dressmakers in california um you know can take a year to gather all your materials your shells um a couple years even and one thing i love about our dresses is that they're very um, family and community um, based because in order to get all these materials you really have to include your family members to help you gather for me um we also have these top notches made with feathers that i didn't bring but um, we have a lot of uh, materials that need to be gathered and processed. And so that's where your family or your community comes in into play. For me, you know, I'm lucky I have family that hunt for me or gather shells for me. 
um, what when we could gather. Um, but, you know, I have a lot of family support, so I can't do this on my own. Um, you know, it, it takes my community and my family to, to support me and they do. And so I, I feel real blessed to have, um, a strong community that's committed to, um, sustaining, um, our dance stresses. So with that, um, I think we can open it up to questions and answers in a little bit. Um, I know a lot of people before we get into that are curious about why the abalone, um, uh, there's a moratorium on, on abalone and and it has to do with our our conditions of our oceans, right? So um, when things are out of balance, um, it's like a domino effect. So it's not just, oh, ocean waters are getting warmer. There's repercussions and there's a chain of events that happen. So as our oceans become warmer, um, there are certain species that aren't thriving. Um, so starfish are one of those species. Starfish are a natural predator that help um, maintain the population of the purple sea urchins. So now that there's a decline in um, in the starfish, what's happening is the um, purple sea urchins are increasing their population and they feed off the kelp edge, which is also the same food that abalones need. Um, Purple sea urchins can reproduce and grow and eat faster than abalone. So what's happening is they're devouring the um, kelp beds. And so it's almost like deforestation underwater. And so what's happening is abalones are unable to thrive because they're not getting enough um, food. And so um, it's a complex situation. It's not just one thing, um, you know, um, our, as our ocean temperatures get water, we are seeing already some coastal communities um, being impacted and having to be moved. Um, and, and that's not just in California, but that's statewide. Um, and so a lot of communities are already being impacted. And, you know, it's, it's scary because I always thought I'd be able to pass on shell work or shell work making to my kids or grandkids. Um, but I never in my lifetime thought that I would be witnessing um, a species going extinct. And so it, it's worrisome because when you think about it, it all this is happening under the ocean. All, um, people aren't aware of it because they're not having a relationship with the ocean um, or they're not living in a coastal area. So they're insulated from the impacts of climate change. And so what's happening is that you know, people think that maybe it's not real or that it's real, but it's still years off. I can tell you coastal communities are seeing it and feeling it. And it's it's unfortunate that um, there's not a, a stronger um, pushback on um, mitigating climate change. I, I wish that, um, you know, there was more being done, um, especially before it's too late. And I'm hoping that this dress will address that issue. I'm hoping that it transforms people to visually understand the impacts of, of climate change and, and that, you know, it's, it's coming. It's actually, it's here, it's coming. And I also want to send out a challenge to artists that maybe don't work with place-based materials and what I mean by place-based materials are those materials that come from your homelands that usually you work with to create um, pre-contact types of work. Or, um, you know, I always consider my work pre-contact, but um, I kind of make them very contemporary in, in design. Um, and for those of you that, like I said, not working with um, place-based materials, you know, think about it if there was no more paint. <laughs> or no more silver or no more materials that you work with? How would you continue your art? And I try and challenge all artists because even, even if I do order something, maybe I don't gather it. Um, like my glass beads, of course I don't, I don't gather those, but um, I look for green companies that make products that I use that are um, not endangering the environment. Um, and I also support um, companies that are ethical in, in their business practices. So um, I do a lot of research from the vendors I use. 
Um, I spend a lot of time researching and practicing with maybe other materials that are greener that um, work differently than um, than synthetic materials. So it's it's a challenge. I, I ask all artists to think about think about your materials, your process, and your impact on climate change with the materials you use, and and hopefully we can come up with alternatives. Um, I like this ochre that I use for the dress. Um, we normally gather the red in our area and white, like I said previously. Um, but I had ordered some blue ochre from Australia from an Aboriginal company. Um, and due to COVID, it didn't get here in time. So I was kind of panicking because um, I already have enough difficulty accessing materials, let alone having COVID. <laughs> Um, impact uh, my ability to access materials. So um, I was able to find a local art store that was doing curbside that had ochre, some dry pigments. So I was able to mix um, my dry pigments and get the color that I, I, I had ordered. Um, so just being mindful of your materials and how you use them. Sometimes materials that are organic um, cost a little more, but I think it's worth it. Um, and oftentimes you can support people in your community to gather those things. So maybe there's someone in your community that needs an income and maybe they can um, learn how to gather or process materials for you. Um, so there's there's ways of um, taking our work and making it green um, or making it more eco-friendly. So I, I hope to encourage other artists to look at their process and, and do so. Um, the other thing that I think is important to remember is that what someone does upstream or in, in, in their environment, they might think that, oh, well, it's far away from the ocean, but it's not. Um, our waterways are connected. Um, and so what you do upstream does affect people downstream and it does um, impact our river mouth, which where um, our salmon runs are. So, um, you know, if you are doing agriculture, or ranching, a lot of those industries um, have a high impact on our land. And so um, maybe if you're a wine drinker, you can um, research uh, um, wineries that have greener practices. Same with your cattle, buy from more ethical companies, buy from small ranchers that are doing good work. Um, so I'm just kind of challenging everybody, even collectors, you know, if artists have to use different materials, say coral, um, value it the same because a lot of us will eventually start to have a, to replace our materials. Um, I am in that, <laughs> in that position currently, I can't um, get materials. The shells that I have are from stockpiles or people who were divers that had saved their shells that have been um, donating to me graciously. Um, sometimes I find them older shells at flea markets or whatnot. So, you know, I'm always on the out, um, lookout for shells, but, um, you know, I do have to transition because I won't be able to um, continue this and I want to save the shells I have for my community so that they can, you know, our, our people can have what they need for our dances. So, um, you know, I'm scaling back quite a bit on, on my inventory and transitioning. Um, one of the things that I'm doing to transition is I'm making smaller size dresses. So I'm working on a line of dolls um, and collaborating with my husband, who's a sculptor. Um, he actually um, sculpted the dolls from wood and then um, I create the narratives and on the dresses. I have a lot of scrap material um, after years of doing this. So it's a good way to use up all my materials that I do have that um, I normally couldn't use in a larger version. Um, and then, um, because I'm not a carver, I have to ask my husband to help me with it. Um, he eventually said, honey, you're going to have to learn to carve your own because I have my own work to do. So, um, I'm transitioning into learning a new medium. And so that'll be interesting. And I hope you follow me on that journey, um, and see some of my newer dolls. I have two completed so far and working on a couple more. Um, I'm transitioning from wood to clay because I think clay is a little bit easier uh, for me to produce and it's a little more sustainable. So um, I'm transitioning the dolls into clay. 
Um, so I'm hoping to have a couple of those um, in the next couple months available. Um, I'll post them on my social media once I get them done. I, I ordered my clay months ago um, and it hasn't come. Um, so COVID uh, has made um, getting materials just as hard as climate change for me. Um, but it's, it's a weird kind of surreal space that we're all enduring and, and working through. Um, and I haven't been able to go back home. Um, for those of you that don't know, my, my husband's from Hamas, um, and I moved to, um, his community. Um, I go back home usually once a month and I haven't been able to get back home, um, for several months now. And I haven't been able to even get back to Hamas because they're also um, closed as well to protect um, the community. So I've been here at SAR for um, three months now. Um, hopefully I'll be able to go back home soon and then back home to California as well. Um, I miss my community and I want to go get some um, basket materials and some more bark. Um, although I have to say there's a lot of bark um, willow out here in Cottonwood. So I am able to still get those materials, but um, more um, materials that are um, specific to my bioregion, I'm hoping to be able to go gather those soon um, and um, visit my home. For those of you that live away from your tribal communities, you know how how hard it is when you miss home. So I'm just excited um, to get back to California um, some point in the next couple months, hopefully. Um, I guess it's a wait and see game. Um, and we just have to kind of ride this, this virus out and be safe. So um, I know we're gonna open this up for questions. I done a lot of content in a short amount of time. Um, so we'll do the questions live. So um, be thinking of questions that you want to ask and I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks for tuning in. All right, I'm here live with Leah. Can you hear me, Leah? I can. Okay, great. Thank you so much for sharing. That was really fascinating and it was um, really wonderful to get an inside look at your studio and the materials and what you've been working on during your residency. Um, let's see, so I wrote down, a, I know we have some audience questions, but I wrote down a couple of questions myself. Um, I love how you describe yourself as a place-based artist. And I'm just curious um, if you could share a little bit more about what it's like to be um, someone is, who is so deeply place-based but living away from your home community. Um, it's, it's hard, but given the cost of living of my um, traditional homelands, it's, it's worth it to not live there. Um, <laughs> California is incredibly expensive, especially the coastal areas. Um, so it's kind of, a, and one thing about California is it's, you know, a little busier than, than where I'm living now. So I kind of enjoy less traffic and uh, I don't know, it's just a different environment. But when I drive anywhere, um, I always tend to look at plants or the bioregion to, kind of figure out where I am. Um, and so when I got to the Southwest, um, there were a lot of plants that were similar. So we, you know, we both have yucca, we both have deer grass, bear grass, um, willow, cottonwood. So there's a lot of um, materials I can still use. And then one day my husband and I were driving to Gallup and I told him pull over. I, I found some tule, you know, which is, um, primarily a plant that grows in marsh areas and he was like there is no tule out here but we pulled off and sure enough we found a patch of, of tule oh. <laughs> um, so you just always have to be uh, looking for what you need in the environment yeah. um, or be able to adapt a little bit but so far I've been able to get a lot of the materials I need except mm -hmm. for shell but yeah. I mean even back then Chumash brought shell into the southwest so 
Mm-hmm. Um, in a way, I'm still kind of doing those same trade routes and, and going along the way. Um, David asks, um, Leah, since there is a moratorium on abalone shells here, is there a part of the world that you can acquire abalone shells from? Another the, part of the, the world, sorry. Yeah, the, the shells that we use are um, indigenous to California. So um, they, I mean, there's Palo shell in other parts of the world, but they're also endangered. So, um, and, and of course people will say, well, there's farmed abalone and, and there is farmed abalone. Um, the problem, if you're using it for, um, other than food, if you're using it for the shell, um, what happens is it's very thin and, and they're small, so it doesn't necessarily work for larger pieces of shell work. They work great for inlay or for, you know, maybe a little bits on earrings, but, um, and they also don't have the rich red color of red abalone, which is indigenous mm-hmm. to the California coast. So I try to stick, you know, with what it comes from my area because it, that's what gives um, our a material culture, its distinct look is our relationship with its bioregion. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Um, and then kind of similarly, Barbara W asks, I wonder whether you could get abalone shells from restaurants who use the meat. Um, yeah, and again, that's it's they're using farmed meat. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Yeah, so there's because yeah, we, we can't get abalone. It's it's illegal. Um, but like I said, you can use some of the, sh- the farm. I, I have used farm and I do use farm for smaller pieces, like the little tiny pieces on some of my circle earrings or smaller pieces, um, just because they don't have a heavy weight to them. And so they, they work well for earrings or for inlay, but for larger mm-hmm. pieces or dance dresses where the shells are going to be hitting each other when you're dancing, it, it's, um, it's too fragile to use a right. farm. That makes sense. Um, And then we have a question from Barbara S. She asks, um, since um, abalone is so difficult to acquire these days, are you using different materials now to decorate your skirts? And that's kind of a good question uh, (laughs) in that we're still kind of talking about that. um, Mm -hmm. I don't have the answer right now because as as a community, Um, we need to have these conversations about what those alternative materials might look like. Um, I think it needs to be a collective conversation and it shouldn't just be, um, you know, led by one person. Um, I think that in order for it to be um, or belong to the community, it needs to come from the community. So we need to have those dialogues uh, amongst ourselves on what those replacements might be. Um, and how we transition into using different materials and what that might look like. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have a comment from Mona. She says, here in her homeland on the central coast of California, we miss gathering abalone and digging pismo clams. In addition to their cultural and artistic importance, they were a main food source for our families. Leah's work is beautiful and museum quality. Thank you, Mona. That's our tribal chair. (laughs) Oh, that's so sweet. Um, Okay, well, let's see. I have some more questions for you that I wrote down if that's okay. Um, So I love the way, the direction that the dress is going. The blue blue ochre just looks really beautiful. Um, And you mentioned some other elements that you hope to incorporate like the abalone um, water droplets. Can you talk a little bit more about the direction that the dress is gonna be going um, after this fellowship? Yeah, so um, in addition to just um, lack of access due to environmental degradation, um, trying to do the project during the middle of a pandemic has also created some barriers to getting materials. Um, So I had originally planned to drive to California to get my shells, um, and it just didn't work out. Um, So I've Finally, was I was hoping that maybe this COVID thing wouldn't be as bad as it was, and I was hoping, oh, maybe you know I'll be able to go in April. Um, but as things escalated, I realized that um, I'd have to try and um, get some of my stuff sent out to me. So um, the dress right now um, again has the water elements and, and 
if you didn't tune in last night, here's one of the shells and I, can sh I don't know if you can see because the light's bad here, but I've drawn my templates of water droplets in here and those will get cut and processed and put on the shell, I mean on the, the dress. Um, and then I wanted to incorporate on our top notch the element of um, fire because in California, we've had an increase in our wildfires. And um, so I wanted to bring that element in. Um, when we dance, we have these feathered top knots that sit on top of our heads. Um, and so I was going to do, um, to burn some of those and paint them um, so that they look like they have um, been in a fire. Um, so the dress has that element of two things that we're seeing in California, um, which is the, um, rising ocean water and um, the increased fires. That's great. I'm, it sounds like it's gonna be really powerful and I can't wait to see the final product. Let's see, we have another question from the audience. Amy says that she would like to hear more about how your family helps you with your work. Well, I have to say it's um, my kids, my cousins, um, my friends, everybody helps. Um, and that's not unusual for um, uh, California Indians who make dresses. Um, usually your family, it takes time to gather. We use a lot of feathers. We use, um, you know, hides. We use bark. We use shell. So everything that we use, pretty much except for the glass beads that I incorporate, um, come from the environment and come from our bioregion. So um, it takes literally a lot of people to collect for one dress. And so um, everybody usually participates. Um, sometimes my cousins will call when I'm in town and they'll say, hey, we got, you know, uh, this for you, come get it. And um, so that's helpful because I couldn't do this without my community or my family's support. Um, and it's great because then everybody's, um, kind of love goes into that dress, right? So it's not just me making it, it's everybody making it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Great question, Amy. Um, let's see. Can you talk about any future projects that you have coming up after this or are they top secret? Mm, I did share a little bit on Instagram live yesterday, but um, I am working on another dress. Um, and again, when I approach my dresses, um, I try and take a community en engagement approach. So um, I had talked to a couple um, ballet dancers and I had noticed that there was a disparity in um, people of color in, in ballet. And so I wanted to talk about that a little bit more. And since I make dance dresses, I thought, well, why don't I make a dance dress um, using our materials, but just using them um, in a different format or a different way. So I am, let me see if I can grab it. Um, I am working on a dress, it's not done. Um, but, um, so one of the materials we use is Thule. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but um, so this is going to be the tutu and then this is the, the bodice, but um, it'll have um, our feather work in it and abalone work for the sequence. Um, and then the tutu has different layers of Thule. It's kind of hard to see. Um, we're doing this remote, we're doing this on iPhone. So um, I apologize for the quality, but, um, so when I usually do a project, it usually has a statement with it and I like a lot of participation. So um, I did send out a questionnaire to a lot of um, indigenous ballerinas and a lot of them were able to give me feedback. Um, so I don't wanna speak for them, but I wanted to make something because I recognize them and see their work and I see how, um, isolating it must be or lonely it must be sometimes to be in spaces that aren't always um, welcoming to people of color. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm excited to see that. Thank you for sharing. All right, and I think I just have one last question for you. Um, so I know everything is kind of delayed or we're not really sure when things are gonna happen again, but if someone wanted to stay um, up to date on your work and any um, upcoming exhibitions, what's the best way to do that? 
Um, usually through social media. So um, uh, Instagram, Facebook are all good ways to kind of keep up with what I'm doing. Um, it's hard to say, you know, when things will open up. I right. think, um, you know, the largest shows will be the last thing to come back. And so many artists are having to be creative in how we engage um, with um, our collectors or how we engage with newer audiences. And so just um, looking at social media as one of those tools that I'll probably be using uh, more in the future. I do have a website, um, but you can't really engage on a website um, like right. you can social media. So I don't know, maybe I'll be brave enough and do a TikTok video, who knows? Um, <laughs> my kids um, with my community or other communities on a projects, um, I'm a very social person. So I enjoy that interaction and I like learning from other artists and, and other mediums. And I, you know, I'm not a, a ballerina um but i love the the dance and i i wanted to honor those um dancers and so you know it gives me an opportunity to work with a different group of people um that i don't normally get to work with so i like collaborating and working um on projects with other people so um you know if there's artists out there that like to collaborate or have ideas um i'm always um up for working with others that's great. It looks like we got one more question in from the audience. Um, Aaron asks, once done, how and where do you hope the dress will have maximum impact in terms of raising awareness? A solo or group temporary exhibit in a museum collection or to stay with you and your community? Um, I'm hoping that it gets exhibit and goes outside of our community. Um, I think that um, for me, like, it's always hard when you do a, a project like this because it's it it's hard to um, I don't know put it out in the world in a way that lots of people can see it. So um, most likely I'll probably have it photographed and then share it on social media along with the narrative that I write. I'm really heavy on my narrative, so I mm -hmm. write a lot. Um, I have a writing partner um, and we enjoy kind of crafting these narratives um, and. I think that sometimes when I put them on social media with the narratives, a lot of times um, museums will co contact me. Um, I did another dress recently, um, which I call the trash dress. Um, it was really um, my frustration going out and trying to gather shells, um, places where we used to have an abundance of olive shells and I was trying to collect mm -hmm. some. And there was nothing but plastic and trash and bottle caps. And so I literally just grabbed all of those things because there was no shells. And so I made a dress and replaced the shells with all of the um, debris that I found in our gathering spot um, and made a dress. And instead of painting the bottom um, with our red ochre, I used oil because there was just so much oil all over the place mm -hmm. on the surface of the water. Um, so I do other dresses and usually a museum will ask to um, have them on display or on loan. Um, I'm in the process of um, a couple acquisitions on some of the other dresses I've done. So um, hopefully those will um, be coming to an exhibit soon. COVID's kind of put a damper on things or delayed things. So usually I announce on social media um, okay. if there's um, an exhibit coming up. Great, thank you. And we'll try to keep everyone posted as well if um, we hear of any exhibitions or galleries that Leah is going to be uh, showing her work at. Um, let's see, we have another comment from the audience. Um, Tacmuse, I'm sorry if I said your name wrong. Um, they say, fabulous job connecting artists and art worlds to climate change. Drawing those concrete and specific connections is so compelling. Yes, I agree. And I do, I challenge other artists to, you know, even if you're not working with place-based materials, I mean, I challenge all artists to look at their practices and, and to look at their, you know, carbon footprint on and the materials that they're using and maybe look at um, greener practices within their own artwork, even if you're, you know, working with um, paint or other, just any other medium, just, you know, be mindful of that and think about that. Um, 
you know, in for collectors or, or, or museum people, gift shops, um, galleries, you know, as we start having to replace pieces or work, you know, it might not be coral anymore. It might not be turquoise in the future. It might not be, mm -hmm. just be supportive of those artists that are thinking outside the box and starting to experiment with um, alternative materials because a lot of these materials will not be around. Well, I think that's a great note to end on. Um, it's a really strong message and I appreciate you taking the time to chat with me and um, share some information about your project and your practice. It was uh, really nice to get to have this interaction with you. Well, thank you everybody and thanks Felicia. Yeah, thank you for joining everyone. Bye.